Zachariah Anani. He'll bless you next. <laughs> Two important things. First of all, bear with me. I'm a teacher, I'm not a preacher. Different than him. <laughs> and second, you have the accent, not me. <laughs> First, I'd like to start by thanking this glorious country, which did before, instead going on, paying blood for a guy like me to stand up freely and talk. I got a story to tell you. My name is Zakaria Hassan Anan. It's very well clerical name in three different countries, in Egypt, in Jordan, in Lebanon. My grand great-grandfather came from Egypt as an imam. Imam is the highest clergy in Islam. He was sent to Lebanon, so he was leading in a mosque. My grandfather became an imam for another area where I was born, called Ghbayri in Beirut. My father skipped the road. He was a womanizer, alcoholic, Anything would provide him to be a, a holy man. So the family thought that I'll carry the torch. I'll be the next one as an imam in the family. So I was introduced to Islamic school since I was three years old. Learning Quran, mimicking, praying, doing everything which is start from the beginning, make this small tree grow up to be a strong one. With all of that, by the age 13, God had blessed me with a body. I was 100, almost 150, 80 pounds of muscles, and I was really strong. Now I'm diabetic and I'm shrinking. <laughs> Thank God. By that time, I was really rebellious. The PLO had their, uh, their uh, warriors marching in the streets, and with the with, uh, conviction of my religious uprising, I really wanted to be a warrior like those warriors. I wanted to go and fight and carry at the end the, the skulls of my enemies and hit the gates of heaven with it and, say, and threw it in front of the throne of God, Allah, and says, here's my prize. So I went and joined the militant fragments, which was created by then small Muslim military fragments created by them by PLO. It was okay for the family because only according to the Islamic doctrine, only the warrior who dies killing in the battlefield would reach to heaven and his family is to be feared and respected. So I was trained when I was, first, um, when I was 13. I had my first kill when I was 14. They celebrated I became a man. This kind of life this kind of training, this kind of um, rigid life, at the end, with all the blood and all of that suffering within cells, will also uh, take you in either one of the two ways. Either will make you a lunatic, very lunatic, a dedicated Muslim like the people who did the towers, or the zeal will disappear and there will be nothing left but a killing machine. In my case, the, the zeal, the religious zeal, had disappeared within a few months. And there's nothing left by a killing machine. This kind of killing in life make you reach to a place where life meant nothing whatsoever. Neither yours, neither the others. I'll share you with a story. One time they bring this very, very religious guy to my group. He starts knocking on our doors at 3 o'clock in the morning for the first prayers. I, write, I reach up to him in the kitchen next day, put my hand around his shoulder. This is very friendly. And says, don't wake me up at 3 o'clock in the morning. I don't want to come to the prayers at 3 o'clock in the morning. He looked at me in a very stiff way and said, my duty is to come and wake you up. It's up to you to come to the prayers or not. 
I looked at him in a very challenging way and said, you come and knock on my door at 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm going to shoot you. <laughs> he knocks on my, uh, my, didn't believe me, knocks on my door at 3 o'clock in the morning. I pick up my, my, man, my 9 millimeter from under my pillow and look at the door, measure with his chest and shoot him through the door and go back to sleep. As simple as that. So life went on like this, really bad. And I lived in a way I was con content and accepting and believing very much that I'll never, ever, ever, ever reach the, the 18th or the 20th of my life. I'll be killed before then. That's why when I, after later on I became a Christian, it took from a missionary two years to teach me to eat with, ha with two hands above the table. Because I used to eat all the time with one hand above the table and the other hand is on my knees with where, where is my pistol. So, one day, I was about two months to be 17 years old. One day, my whole regiment wasn't there, and I felt bored. So I decided to go to a theater where either I'll see a good film or I'll pick up a good fight. I go to this theater, which is 300 seats, and there was only one old man, and the film was dull. So I left. I was supposed to turn left to go to the bus, to go to my area, Yet I turned right, and at the, the corner, there was a gathering. I said, yay, this is a fight, so I dashed. <laughs> Few feet away, here stands this American, talking to someone else. And I said, ah, an American. You see, I was equipped and trained to fight and kill Jews and hate Americans. And I turned around to walk away when this American, who was a Southern Baptist missionary, said in a Jordanian accent, which I, uh, dialogue, which I know it very well, he said, Jesus Christ will give you new hope, will give you life, will give you salvation. And I stood there. Who is this Jesus? You see, he used the word, Arab, the Arabic word for Jesus, Yeshua, which I've never really heard it before. My mom, accordingly, was supposed to be coming out of a like, Catholic background. And I had, in 1975, I had led my men in the streets of Beirut fighting Christians, so I knew Christians exist. But who is this Yeshua? Is there another life? Is there salvation? Is there new hope? Let's ask this guy, most probably he knows what he's talking about. So I stood up there, and when, he's about, when he finished, he was about to leave, and everybody had left, he was just turning to leave. I raised my voice and said, do you believe what you are saying? He turned around and said, yes, otherwise I won't say it. I said, okay, fine, go ahead, explain it. The man, the man started trying to explain. I said, hold it, I can prove to you that your God, your Christ, does not exist in my life, not in my life at least. I said, okay, go ahead. I picked up an event, I went through it a uh, few months before I met that guy. I was coming back from a battlefield with two warriors with me. One boy, one girl. And we were ambushed. In an ambush, everyone runs for his life. When I was right behind the rocks, the girl was next to me. The guy was not there. I looked above the rocks to see how many are attacking us and when and where is the boy. I need him right there and then. He was right there in the middle of the road, injured, still alive. The girl decided to help him. I refused. She looked at me in a very strange way. I could never forget it. Pick up her machine gun jump above the rocks, walks towards the injured guy, shooting, shouting, reaching to him, grabbing him by the shoulder, lifting him up, backing up while she's shooting and shouting. And I thought that I'd be less than an animal if I don't do something and help. So I did the same. I jump above the rocks, walk, shoot, shout, reach, grab, pack up, and, and uh, push backwards. 